Welcome to Hopscotch Friday, your pop culture binge with Stevie and Emmett. Hello, welcome to Hopscotch Friday. This is Stevie. And this is Emmett. Caught this... you by surprise. Yeah, you did. You jumped in there. <laughs> good, good, good. Mix it up, mix it up. And we thought we would just throw together a quick episode on a show that we have been revisiting recently. Yes. And I think despite its cancellation, it still remains quite poignant. And it's one of the few shows that we've watched which actually addressed the realities of COVID, uh, never mind the realities of a workplace. So yeah, we're going to be talking about Superstore, which was the America Ferrara vehicle, and we'll get into that situation shortly as well. But yeah, we're going to be recording a few other episodes soon. Um, we have things to say about the latest Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Um, Happily, it is, I would say, you know, capsule review back on track. Yeah, I, I, I thought so. Yeah, I, I don't know if we'll ever get around to talking about the Batman, but we saw the Batman. Uh, I don't know that there's anything to say. I agree. I, I kind know. of feel like giving the Batman airtime is more than it deserves, which you know is kind of sad because I, I feel like I want to support a Robert Pattinson career. Sure, yeah, he's an interesting guy. At the guy. same time, I did not see anything in that film because I could not see anything. So I have nothing to say about it. Mm-hmm. And we really, we really uh, got psyched up for it. We um, we waited for oh, it to I be released. I was going to give it an effort. Absolutely. We waited for it to be released digitally. Uh, we had friends who'd seen it in the cinema and we were debating it and then it dropped and we we're like, oh, let's just watch it. And I went to a fancy sandwich place, got some really nice sandwiches, uh, got some fancy drinks, sat down, turned the lights down low, watched the Batman, and then we proceeded to be baffled by some of the Raptors' praise over the next, what's it, like two hours plus, two and a half hours of movie time? It's long. You know, I'm sure it's very worthy effort in terms of everybody everybody did their best, but... um, it was a lot of movie. Let's just put it that way. Uh, well, it was a lot of movie, but it wasn't. And I think that's the problem here. And look, you know, as I said, I don't have anything to say about it, but here I go and say a whole bunch of stuff about the Batman, which is not what we're supposed to be talking about. But what I want to say is that there was nothing that actually compelled me to watch it to the point where I think I tuned out about halfway through and I don't recall exactly what happened when where how I could not see properly what was actually happening on the screen because it was so muddy and murky and dark and I felt that some of the dialogue was so labored and also ridiculous that I got annoyed so I tuned out and that is the Batman for me is just nothing it's just a a blank I don't I also am kind of at that point where I and I've said this before I don't really understand why Batman has turned into this this iteration of his character I think you know I do miss the times when we could be just be ridiculously campy with Batman and I feel like our society our you know collective admiration for billionaires to save the world and come up with new technologies and be the vigilantes we need buying Twitter and Christ knows what else like it's just become this sad situation and I I don't recognize it anymore so I'm not I'm no longer interested. Like I love the stupidity of, you know, Batman and Robin and all the ridiculous characterizations and right back to Batman 66, all that kind of stuff. But then all through the 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 stupid movies, the Mr. Freeze movies, the ridiculousness movies, you know, the Michael Keaton era, all of that is great for different reasons. But mostly because it's having a bit of fun, at least a little bit of fun. It acknowledges the the ridiculousness that is Batman as a as this you know billionaire playboy vigilante. And then you know it's just a small story, whereas for some reason it's become this broody dude bro bullshit. 
Once I again, I blame Michael Uslan, <laughs> who holds the rights to Batman. This is his vision, more or less. Just no. Just yeah. let's have more fun with Batman. It's like mm. it, it, 66 did it so well to say, you know, here's the ridiculous creations he's come up with. Here's the ridiculous situations he's going to save us from. Here's the crazy villains that we can come up with. Don't It takes itself way too seriously now, and I just don't have time for it. I'll tell you what, it's four decades of gay panic. That's what. That's why we have the Batman we have today, because Andy Warhol went to a screening of Batman 66, and now it's like, oh, no, it's too camp now, it's too camp. Um, It doesn't make sense. It's actually a really interesting, and I'm sure there's some academics out there, you know, back in the day, it was all about Buffy. You get your PhD in Buffy. I'm sure now you can get your PhD in the evolution of Batman and why Batman has become this particular character. But it's just, it's so... It's also it's so close to reality in so many respects. Like this is the guy who's sitting at home listening to Joe Rogan and fiddle fart assing around in his back cave and decides to come out at night and spew bullshit about, you know, how the world is against him, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, he's a billionaire, can do whatever the fuck he wants. Um, you know, I think the only very minor interesting thing about it was this idea of what's the point of police at a police force in the context of a vigilante who has infinite resources, who's just going to go out there anyway and what that relationship is. But I think it's, it's the Riddler, right? Yes. I keep getting this wrong. The question mark. Um, He could have been really interesting because he like sees it. And I've said this before as well. I've said, I think Batman is the Joker. I think they are one character. They are two sides of a coin. Um, and then in this one, you've got the Riddler who is like seeing himself as kindred to Batman. And I'm like, why did we not explore that? Because they are the same. Like it's, it's so obvious. It's right in front of you. The psychology of these two individuals who are, but each thinks that they're doing the right thing. Both of whom are breaking the law and acting outside of civil society. Like, why was that not explored more? Like, I'm not even going to talk about Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman because what the fuck was that about? They had no... <laughs> okay, this is not the Batman episode. I'm just going to finish with this. They have no chemistry. I don't believe it for a second. If you, for some reason, have a lot of time on your hands, go and watch it just for the sake of watching it. But I don't care anymore. You've killed Batman for me. It's over. I loved Batman. I wanted to be Batman. When I was little, <sighs> feel okay, done. Emmett is laughing at me. That's cool. That's fine. Uh, and in an attempt at a segue, I, uh, I've been trying to write little short reviews for the Hot Scotch Friday blog. And today, I, uh, at the time of recording, I wrote a quick piece on my latest obsession, which is the show From. And one of the things I liked about From was From features a character named Jade, who's an obnoxious tech bro billionaire dude. Uh, I think the name of the actor is David Alpa, and he clearly is visually styled on Tony Stark, and mm-hmm. he behaves like Elon Musk, and he has all these beha- and he every character in the show says what a dick. Like everybody hates him so much, and just to answer what a your dick. But answer your point, you know, earlier about uh, Batman being this billionaire dude and this figure, that aspirational figure because he's a billionaire. In from. You take that guy, you put him in this supernatural story where his wealth has absolutely no value. Everyone just hates him because he's useless. He uh, contributes nothing. Turns out he's not actually useless. He's got skills. But uh, those first couple episodes where we were getting to know Jade, I really enjoyed. I thought that was a great joke. I thought there was a lot of meta humor at uh, the sort of billionaire uh, playboy philanthropist uh, idea with that character um and from as a as i said in the review it's the scrappy little contender that could i think it's an interesting horror show i am um, i appreciate it i think it doesn't have the same benefit of the zeitgeist that yellow jackets did uh so yeah i'm i'm really happy they're doing a second season of from and i also wrote a quick review about obi-wan kenobi which you know where i argue that star wars could benefit from stealing a couple of tricks from Dungeons and Dragons in terms of emergent storytelling and just using this broad setting to tell many different kinds of stories instead of the same story over and over again and 
which is what they're doing in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Like it's actually, yep. I found it charming. I found Hugh McGregor, you know, interesting to watch. And, and a young actress that they have on the show is, she's adorable. I won't spoil who she is playing. Um, but yeah, overall I did, was left with the question after those two episodes of well, why are we doing this again? Um, so yeah, we were, we're pushing out a little more content for trying to mix in the podcast up with, you know, short form written reviews and uh, a few other things. Uh, we'll, we'll continue at this speed. Um, Superstore, you really want to talk about Superstore? I wanted to talk about Superstore because I've been reflecting on it, actually, because as you said, this is our second run through of this show. The final season, I think we finally we just finally got access to it not very long ago um, via our streaming services here in Australia. Um, so we watched that and then for some reason, I don't know why we went back to the beginning and watched it all over. I think that was you looking for something that was joyful or at least, you yeah. know, a bit I- more of a spark than some of the, like, I, and I think what you said it last episode was that we've been ragging on a bunch of things for a little while, which I don't think has to do with our perspective on the world. I think there's just a fair amount of crap that is flooding um streaming channels there's just this like everything is available to you now or like there's open access so let's just flood it with stuff and you've got to have new things all the time and I think some stuff is getting hyped that doesn't necessarily deserve it or and I said this to you yesterday while we when we finished watching um everything everywhere all at once is that what it's called I keep getting it wrong Um, which is we will be doing an episode on that I think or that that's on the cards absolutely I think we should uh, I say, you know, people need to watch more movies or people need to like expand their uh, their repertoire or their interests to see different kinds of things and different um, types of movies and, and what is influencing cinema. Um, but the point I was trying to make is that I think, yeah, there's like a flood of stuff and people are raving about this, that and the other. And I don't necessarily share that opinion. So we've we're looking for something that is reliably going to be of interest. And usually that's probably something like Superstore or you quite like to rewatch Community and we watch Bob's Burgers, those kinds of things that, you know, it's a short, sharp burst of something that you're probably going to walk away with um, and make you happy. Superstore is a funny one though. And I think it probably does speak to all of those examples as well. It's kind of happy, sad. And I think happy, sad is a happy medium for the both of us, because I think we appreciate the fact that you can have positivity and you can have negativity and they can stick together, but sometimes you need one to complement the other um, for the, that emotion to kind of really be, to hit home. So <laughs> Superstore, and I, I was thinking about it because the characters are actually awful, but also it's exactly like, a workplace or high school where you are thrown into a group of people who you don't necessarily have a big connection with or like you don't necessarily share your worldview with even but for the sake of the fact that you have to spend eight hours together whatever the length of your shift is together over a period of extended period of time you get along and you have experiences and you, you know, you gossip and you like this person or you don't like that person, but you tolerate them. And, and I just think that sh- the show demonstrates that really well. And I don't quite understand how they've managed to do it because it's, it's, it strikes me as being actually really different from a lot of other television shows. It's not a straight sitcom. It does have a lot of happy moments. It has a lot of sad moments. It's got really annoying characters who kind of peak and trough throughout the time. But it's got this amazing ensemble cast that regardless of who or what their character is about, they seem to really be enjoying interacting with each other and having that opportunity to act and play almost alongside each other. I don't know how much of the show is actually improvised, but I would assume that there's a fair amount of it because you can just kind you can see that you can see that spontaneity in the show. So part of why I wanted to talk about it was that, but then the other part of it is some of the stuff that they address, particularly this concept of unions. I find it really interesting because that's an, a long running thread through this show that ended up having six seasons 
you you know that it's an american tv show it's about relatively low paid workers who have to come to work some of them have been there for years and years and years you were talking about um america ferreira so her character amy sosa is there for she says she's there for something like 17 years before she gets a promotion and heads off to corporate like that's a bloody long time to be working a minimum wage job and for that type of show to have this ongoing conversation about what entitlements means what work means what that's all about and not get cancelled I find really interesting the context, of course, being that America is incredibly anti-union, specifically with places like this. I mean, it's it's only recently in the news that Starbucks and Amazon have been looking to unionize or have successfully unionized, unionized on a very limited scale. You're talking like one store here, one suburb worth of stores, like it's small scale stuff. So, and, and in response, the corporate leadership has lost their lost the wig altogether. They're absolutely, absolutely. losing their Which, minds. You know, so you're talking Just, about a show that is on carried by Netflix. I think it's Netflix. In that, that's that's all operating that same corporate space, talking about the problem and the disconnect between that corporate level profit-driven entity and the people who turn up because literally they need to pay their bills and they are paid bugger all and they have no entitlements the big thread is about maternity leave and it blows my mind that there is no legislated but I think maybe at a very local level there is possible I don't know the detail of American legislation but I'm given to understand that there is basically no legislated requirement to give people maternity leave. It's kind of like if your organization decides to give you two days, two weeks, whatever it is, that's on them. But there's nothing to say that you're entitled to after you have a child, which, you know, we don't have kids. I haven't had a child. I've never been pregnant. I have friends who have been through that process. And the reality is that it is, it fucks up your body. It's, you know, having a small child at home, just out of the womb, popped out to be expected to turn up to work the next day. In an episode, Amy comes to work two days later. She's dead on her feet, but she has to be at work because she has no entitlements. That's yeah. insane to me. And I, uh, I can, I can share a personal anecdote here. I went to a school for two years uh, before doing my leaving cert, and one of the things with this school was that the teachers were non-union so a lot of the teachers uh were taking jobs at this school so that they could it was an, like an additional teaching role they they would fit their schedules around their other jobs right sometimes other teaching jobs and one day in class i had a teacher basically go into labor right in front of me and a week later she was back. Yep. Right. So that just is indicative of the rights that a unionized labor gives you, the protections that it can give you. And once you take that away, that representation, you, you have nothing, you know, beyond the goodwill of your employer, which good luck. But that's exactly right. And I think there, there's other episodes where it actually goes through union conversations about union busting what a union actually is what the purpose of it is how you know you can get involved and I, I don't again I don't understand the American system but it's interesting to me that a show could have such longevity talking about things that are potentially quite controversial to the people who are who are commissioning this so that's really interesting to me but that plays into this concept of the happy sad because these people, these again, like I said, you know, they they are they're there to get along. That it's their relationships, it's their everyday. It's so everyday, but it's so realistic and so funny, but equally so sad. It's a it's an absolute indictment on what working in a place like that is about. 
and I find I don't I don't know why I like it. I just I, it's it seems so realistic. And I think there's a lot of shows out there that do something similar to this that have just kind of played up this one particular aspect. And it's usually a really positive aspect or, or it just outright ignores things. So like, if you reflect on things like um, friends from back in the day, they traveled through 9-11 and there was no reference to it. Like they live in New York, this massive thing happened and there's no conversation about it because they had to maintain this, this, pretend space or they ignored the fact that somehow these people in what would be relatively lowish paid jobs for a period of time like Rachel's a waitress for a while Monica does like random catering and cooking jobs no one knows what Chandler does um Joey is a actor like a a, a jobbing actor who never seems to really have a job until he does for a little while and then he doesn't again so I don't know how he's got money and and doesn't have a Phoebe, has Phoebe plays the piano, plays the, not piano, the guitar, guitar. in in and the Central she, Perk. And she what, occasionally works as a mas- masseur. Money? Yeah, masseuse, That's right, yeah. exactly. So it completely ignores the reality of their situation, whereas this is like so deeply dug into a realistic space that I just think it's really interestingly done. And I know for the most part, like Friends is probably a bad example because it is very out of date. But I think we've come from that space of sitcom to something like this. It's it's an interesting progression to look at because I'd, I'd argue that something like community is similar in that it is happy, sad. It has, it is entrenched in reality to a point. And then I think it actually got away from itself because that had a number of seasons that would have gone for too long for these particular characters to finish their community college degrees. But it would have been nice to kind of see them complete it and then what happens next. Whereas with Superstore, it, it, I think it ended at the right time for those characters in that story, but it, it could have gone on. But the other thing that I really like about it is that it addressed COVID really well, really realistically, didn't ignore it, but then didn't overplay it. And it was like re-watching it now that we're on the other side, other side of COVID. What like, other side? <laughs> No, but like, you know, we're out of lockdowns. We're not doing quite exactly the same thing. We're not, you know, it's it's a really interesting reflection because it's true. I saw some commentary. I saw some commentary about it. And just thinking of your comment about why friends didn't deal with 9-11. And one of the reasons why is because it was was this ongoing trauma for them, um, for Americans, for New Yorkers in particular. Uh, so it would be too upsetting for the friends characters to actually be in that space. That, that was, I think, that was the decision made. Uh, like the West Wing, where the Iraq War never happened. You know, there is a sense of let's not talk about it. You know, uh, the difference with Superstore is Superstore, as you say, does talk about COVID, does have the workers wearing masks, and I have seen comments from people online talking about how upset they are because uh, the characters are standing too close to each other with the masks on or not putting on their masks properly or continue taking the mask off and I'm going but yes that's what it's like that's what it's like when you go outside people don't wear the mask properly excuse me have you been in a shopping center lot checkout line with an old man whose mask is down over like not on his nose it's under his nose and he's snorting away all the time but that's exactly why like the media should be looking at this and our entertainment should be reflective of our lives not telling us that yes it's escapism and some of it should be but like something like this I appreciate the fact that it went to the effort of doing of reflecting life back at us and commentating on it on along the way I think it would have been smart to acknowledge 9-11 with um the friends cast because it's that thing of yes it's a shared trauma were you there how, what how proximate to you were to it were you how do you deal with that idea of it happened over there I wasn't in it but I'm still affected like there's so much you could explore but I get it you know a, a sitcom with stupid characters who basically do the same thing for 10 years 
just keep it going. Look, I can't talk because I used to love Friends. I watched Friends religiously. I like took notes. I've read articles. I was totally into it. I don't know why. I've never been quite so obsessive about anything in my life ever since. It was something that I, you know, needed to give myself focus on when I was a teenager or not a young adult, probably teenager. But I don't know. It's it's just, I just feel like we've evolved but maybe we haven't maybe I've just spent too much time in my own lounge room because of COVID and I think we've you know we need to progress and go somewhere but everybody else is quite happy to ignore the rest of the world I don't know interesting yeah um and and like I think it's it's fun just to reflect on the points you raise as well about how uh these workers are living on the breadline and Amy's had this job for 17 years and one of the reasons why there is some aspect of contentment among the workforce is because, well, there's a shared disdain, but also affection between all the characters for Mark McKinney's Glenn, who's the store manager at the start of the series. And he comes and goes from that role over the course of the seasons. But he is such a like manic pixie dream employer. You know, he, he, is loyal to the structure of the company. He's absolutely a manager who's, you know, a company man, but he also re- repeatedly refers to the fact that he came from a mom and pop type family business that was itself devoured by this chain that he now works for. So he yeah. still has these values from that time. And that's one of the reasons why he takes care of his employees. He looks out for them. He treats them like his children. And we also are brought to understand that he's got this vast family of foster kids as well and he's deeply religious and he's such a bundle of com- of contradictions in this role because uh, you know I've worked retail and most manager types who I interact with were desperately trying to get out of there or small minded enough to enjoy the power dynamic they had over us as employees yep. and you don't want either of those people you know so there is a there is a sort of fantasy to his character that i think is um interesting to reflect on and with the union storyline a lot of the union storyline involves ben feldman's jonah who is personified as this annoying liberal npr loving constantly finger quoting whenever he's talking about something always trying to decenter himself um always in, in you know basically really irritating person mm-hmm. he leads the union storyline he's the one who actually becomes their representative uh with along with sandra and i find that interesting because i wonder if the writers were trying to pull a fast one there where it's like Oh yeah, we're doing a union story, but it's this really annoying guy who all the audience is going to yeah. hate. You know, I wonder if that was part of it. It was like if Chandler all of a sudden uh, became the local member for his office. You know, there would be people would be laughing at the idea of Chandler being a local member leader. Mm. But by the same token, they were they would be having a storyline about unionism in a mainstream show. Superstore pulls that one, and I do wonder if there's a bit of a subversive like game being played there. Oh, I think they're very clever in the way that they do stuff. And I think that's, it's funny because it's so much of it is so blatant, but at the same time, you can kind of see an attempt at trickery for, you know, maybe this is the bit that you show the sponsors as opposed to the rest of the show, which is for the public to slowly consume the idea that maybe this isn't the the wrong way to go. Maybe you shouldn't listen to corporate entities tell you about how great, you know, your life is and you should be thankful to have a job and all that bullshit. So. I can totally see where that would be a strategic way to yeah, shoehorn it's, in. It's that a small, kind of it's a small form of rebellion, but it's still there. And but I think it starts small and then it just grows because it just, it just, it's continuously there throughout a number of seasons. But it does kind of, on reflection, having now rewatched it. It does look like, oh, this is just going to be a short storyline. No, actually, it's fundamental to the next series of the show. And you've also got characters like uh, Colton Dunn's Garrett, who's this, you know, he makes the announcements, which he always preppers with commentary. So there's a little sort of personality creeping through there. Uh, Lauren Ash, who plays Dina, and she's meant to be, again, this jumped up. Yeah, jumped up junior fascist type that I would have been familiar with my my days in retail. But 
I on the second watch, I love her character so much. She's so funny. Lauren mm-hmm. Ash's performance is so funny, and the character's perspective is really interesting. I, I really have more of an appreciation for what they were doing with her. Yeah. And yeah, the other new starter along with Joe Jonah Mateo, who's played by Nico Santos and Cheyenne Nico uh, Secure's character. Cheyenne and Mateo's relationship is so beautiful and their friendship, it just they are so funny together. And mm-hmm. Cheyenne in particular just really, really funny character actor in there. Um so I'm 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 interested in how this show evolved. You know, Justin Spitzer worked on the um, the office before this, and I feel I can see a line of descent there from mm-hmm. the office to this. And now he's doing a show based around uh, car company executives in Detroit called American Auto. Okay, which I think we should maybe check out too. Uh, but sure. he actually left after season four. America Ferrera left at the beginning of season six. And if you li- if you go online again, a lot of people hold America Ferrera responsible for the show being cancelled, which I don't think is fair because I think the ensemble, you know, all that Mark McKinney, Colton Dunn, mm-hmm. Lauren Ash, Ben Feldman, Nico Santos, Nicole Secura, all these actors, John Barinholtz, they hold the show together. Like, it's a great ensemble. Oh. Absolutely. We've, we've got to know them all. Um, the show could have kept going. I I do wonder if it was simply that this show is of a type and it's saying these things that there would have been an agenda to well, let's get it off the airwaves as soon as possible. It hits syndication numbers. So it got over 100 episodes. That's all they really want because then they can keep selling it to other networks over the world. So I'm sure they just went, mean, all right, hit syndication, cancel it. Six seasons is plenty. It's decent. You know, it's decent. Something like this. I, I do. And I don't want to begrudge these people a paycheck, though. Oh, point. of course not. But at the same time, you know, one character leaving, as you say, is not sufficient to shut the whole thing down. I think it sustains itself without Amy as a character, although you know she still is there in kind of ghost form through her ongoing relationship with, ongoing but not ongoing relationship with Jonah and also her brother. Um, his relationship with Mateo. So there are still connections to the concept of Amy in the background, but I think there's there's sufficient interest within the other characters. And this is what I mean. Like it's, it's this ragtag group of people who are stuck together on a shift. They're all very different characters. I think it's interesting you say um, about Cheyenne and Mateo because their relationship, you, their relationship develops over time and it does go from yeah we're we're besties you know gay best friend that kind of um vibe to there's times where they're actually at each other's throats and you've had a bad day and it's really upsetting oh that's the i mean that's the other major thread is you're talking about an undocumented worker someone who just again needs a paycheck but doesn't have their documentation what does that actually mean in an american system do people go out of their way to actually help them out? You've got Glenn, who is like a, a flamboyant Christian. Um, is he Catholic or he's just a Christian? I don't quite. I wonder recall. if he's. Yeah, I wonder if he's a Pentecostal or something like that. Yeah, I yeah. think he's a Protestant but, Christian. Yeah, so like you know, you read articles about how those people look at. This is probably. I I don't really know how to to say this. I don't want to dig myself a hole, but you've got some Christian groups who are very welcoming of and trying to help for, help undocumented people or people who are in need in that respect. But then you've got this whole other group who are very anti that because they believe that, you know, America is for them and prosperity and blah, blah, blah. So there are, there are, mo- there's a mo- few moments where when Glenn finds out, you're like, which way is he actually going to go on this? Is he going to be helpful to Mateo? Or is he going to call ice and get him all fucked up? So you know that again is quite a controversial storyline to choose to go down and that again is a lengthy thread through this show a criticism could be made that with the union stuff and with the ice stuff both storylines evaporate at the end like the ice stuff they do kind of tie it up in a nice little bow towards the end but like let's face it they clearly knew that cancellation was coming and this was the end of it so sure I mean, did Jonah like has a bad meeting and then 
I think the next episode, Amy says something like to him, like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all that union stuff didn't go any any further. And like Matteo gets a job back at the store. Now it's under the counter. Uh, he's been paid in cash, but like it's just it's so unbelievable that his circumstance. That's not the, you know, that's not the just... end of it though. Because it keeps going like that's not the end of it though. It resolves itself at the very end. But it's not just that, you know, he's being paid under the table or what have you. It, it continues to peak and trough the, it, as it a storyline. It peaked with this trauma of him being, you know, the ice people coming into the store. But yeah. then it's sort of the pressure just lifts off that. And then he starts, he's just making jokes about being under ice arrest. You know, like that's, it, it feels like they wanted, like with Jonah being so annoying and, and leading the union storyline, it felt like they wanted to talk about this. They wanted to engage with this topic they did, and then there was only there was a point they couldn't progress beyond, you know, like outright mm-hmm. condemnation of this policy. They they wouldn't do that necessarily. Yeah, I, I don't know that 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 would be something I would criticize the show for in terms of falling into that sitcom need for resolution. You know. Yeah, maybe I don't know. I don't know that I'd be quite so critical. I think it did quite a lot, hmm. and it does like. The, that's the good thing about it is that not every episode resolves itself in a positive way other than to say that these characters are working together that's their kind of positivity in terms of things might go to complete crap or something might have gone horribly wrong but at least you know they have the certainty of everybody else turning up again tomorrow to work the next shift they'll be there they've been through it they'll move on shared trauma shared experience which I quite like but yeah no I think you know this has been my ranting McRant rant in a positive way about this I've probably taken up a lot of the time no I just I wanted to revisit Superstore because I felt like it actually did something quite accurately and as I said earlier it's really that idea that you have these disparate people coming together who might not necessarily run into each other in life generally, but for the fact that they've been thrown together because they all need to have a job or decide to take a course or whatever it happens to be. And the relationships that you form there out of partly out of necessity, so that getting through the day is easier, but how those come to be meaningful relationships and you, I mean, it kind of does make me wonder because there's not a lot of interaction outside of the workplace other than a few key events. Like it's not as though we follow, you know, um, the characters out of the office and into a pub or a bar or whatever. Occasionally there are some events where they all attend. But it's 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 just centralised around that experience. And it's interesting to me, particularly reflecting post COVID where we don't go into the office quite as much as we used to, or at least I very much haven't. Um, I work very closely with my colleagues online, but that there's something to be said for that experience. And there's something to be said for people just kind of ignoring, not ignoring, because that's not quite the right word either. It's just, you make the best of a situation because you're in it with other people. And I, yeah, as I said, because we're watching this the second time through, I really, I really felt that. And I really noticed how well they did that. But also it does go over the time, you see the differences between the characters. So it does let those out without, you know, there, there's full character development going on with all these various different ensemble folks um but they all have a an affinity for each other and they have a love for each other and i find that really interesting especially if you worked in a long uh, in a workplace for a lengthy period of time and there's not necessarily been a quite a lot of turnover i personally recently just moved from one role to another role i miss my team like nobody's business i it, the dynamic has completely changed. I love the people I'm working with now, but I had a team that I was very close to. Um, and it's, I don't know, maybe it's a personal thing for me. Maybe other people will watch it and just go, these are horrible people and horrible characters. and I don't like any of them and it's bullshit and bleh. But I've actually found it quite interesting to rewatch it now. I have actually noticed how 
annoying some of the characters are particularly Jonah he drives me up the wall and to be honest if you look at any of the characters and their ethics and what they believe in Jonah is probably the closest one that I would identify with but for the fact that he is just obnoxious and needs to shut up but you on we know those people as well like you come across the person who you're just you in a meeting you're just like shut up shut up shut up shut up you need to stop talking now you're digging yourself a hole um I'm aware that I have spoken for most of this recording, so I'm probably that person right now. So please don't judge me. But I have looked at it a little bit differently, I think. Post-COVID, different worlds, reflecting on my own experiences with my team, moving into a new role, having less responsibility for other people. Yeah, maybe this is all about me. (laughs) I was thinking about it as well. If you want to talk about COVID and Superstore, it's not just us watching a show about these characters in a low pay, menial job. It's also us watching performers risking their health for us to enjoy this piece of entertainment. That's also what's happening. These people on screen are actually at risk of infection of COVID by being in a shared workspace which is a television set and the industry the film and television industry more or less barreled straight back to work during covid and you know you had stories about uh i i just just because i mentioned at the start of this episode uh i was watching the credits for from and they had the the covid advisor role and that's you see that now at every show there's the COVID advisor person Um, you had these stories about uh, late night hosts, cast members celebrities on the publicity trail catching COVID and it was sort of mentioned in passing a lot I noticed there was Mm -hmm. never really well is this going to have a long term, is Benedict Cumberbatch's long term health impacted by the fact that he contracted COVID at the BAFTAs we don't know. It's not being talked about, but it happened. And he's not a low-paid worker. He's making quite a bit of money, but extremely fi- well paid. Exactly. But I find it, you know, with any actor you're seeing on screen, there's also crew. There's also makeup. There's also catering. There's also p- all yeah. these people in that space, all putting themselves at risk for the sake of your entertainment. So that is almost a one-to-one relationship with the fictional setting of Superstore, which is these people still have to go to work, risk their lives to stock shelves and deal with customers who are oftentimes abusive, hostile, and one memorable uh, exchange, refuse to wear a mask because anyone who insists on a mask mandate is clearly a tool of Satan. (laughs) That is an incident that occurs in this show. And again, eminently believable like absolutely yes i i I think that i think that exact exchange probably happened (laughs) in a department store in many metropolitan cities around the world (laughs) guaranteed it did yeah so i feel it's poignant to watch the show with that in mind as well not just what these fictional characters are going through but what these actors are going through and you know america ferreira you know being blamed for the cancel of the show because she walked away from it um, again, I don't think that's fair. Um, if you're going to make that accusation, the creator of the show, Walking Over from the show, four seasons in, also should be mentioned in that conversation, Justin Spitzer. But I don't, I don't accept that. I think people have a right to pursue their own careers however they want to. And it was a very strong ensemble cast. But you're talking about somebody who had some sway looking at the idea of being a cast member on a show during COVID and probably saying, yeah, nah. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Um, and it's an ensemble show about people in a shared space working in close proximity to one another. There's a risk there. <laughs> As a performer, there's a risk. So, yeah, I just think it's interesting to reflect on that too. Correct. No, I, I actually think it's it's interesting, as I said, re-watching it post-COVID with their whole COVID season I thought was really good but also you know in the last little while we've had quite a few things pop up where they're 
post-apocalyptic themed or there's a virus theme or something has happened theme or it kind of goes the complete other way and it's like oh this fucked up situation let's somehow make it comedic or play it off as weird whereas again you know I've said it 10 times already I appreciate the realism of it and it it plays even though it's very quite accurate it actually still plays absurd because on the one hand, we, we all have this shared trauma now and we all went through it. But at the same time, we're kind of being told, get back to normal. And I'm like, you can't. And then to watch it on screen, it's so strange. Yeah, that's what I think about Superstore. I like it. It's happy, sad. Some people are awful. Some people are interesting. I'm still compelled to watch it. I really like Dina. I really like Garrett. I think I appreciate Sandra much more this time around. Um, Glenn just makes me want to hurt him. Um, Jonah equally just, he's, he's the person who someone needs to pull him aside and they don't do it here and just say, just, just don't just every, every inclination that you have to comment, just, just do not because. Well, I find, I find it interesting that Garrett, does that but often he won't do that because he's like well it's not my responsibility to rein you in go experience the consequences of your actions like you know this is true why am i why am i doing the emotional labor of teaching you how to be a better human like no screw it correct figure it out yourself you know and uh i really like that like i like garrett's role in relation to jonah you know he's a foil if you like but he's also just refusing to participate in the self-improvement of a white man (laughs) yes and i really like that like he is actually the the bigger person here but also chooses not to be like i feel like garrett is seeing everything for what it is but you're exactly right he makes the choice to participate or completely not and just get through his day and be like fuck this i'm just gonna make some jokes on the pa and off we go um who is the other? Oh, yeah, I really appreciate Kelly. So Kelly is a character who comes in. She is transferred from a different store and she and Jonah end up having a relationship for a period of time. But it's still very obvious that he's massively carrying a torch for Amy. But there's a scene after they've broken up where I can't recall why, but for some reason she's back in their store and she basically like he she just doesn't she won't talk to him at all she's basically Jonah is trying to have a conversation with her and she's just like no 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 I am not participating in this and I'm like I love that interaction it's so great she's fantastic as a as a character and as a performance um she yeah it's that's what I'm getting from it to watch this whole thing a second time around is to actually pick up some of the characterizations and characters who aren't who clearly aren't intended to be the primary characters but who bring a lot to the show what's the name of what oh I had everything in front of me and now everything is gone to poo so all my referencing is not there anymore what's his name the one who is in the the warehouse Marcus Marcus, of course, like him as well. Like there's stuff that he says and a lot of his lines are kind of off the cuff and they're meant to be sort of like stupid sideways observations or or just one-liners. And some of the stuff that he comes out with, you're like, yeah, okay, that's that's an interesting take on it or that's a perspective. So there are other people who are coming to the fore as I watch it the second time. So it's just, it's multifaceted. There's lots of layers. And it just reminds me of every workplace I've ever had. You like some people, you don't like some people, you get along with them, you'll celebrate their birthdays, you'll, you know, congratulate them on having children, you're happy to see them move on to something else. All of the things, all of the things. It's it's so much life happens, you know. Like you look at Amy alone, she has her daughter already, she's with her husband who she married quite young she's going through the realization of maybe she shouldn't have she wants to improve herself she has no money she has another child like the whole it's so it's just stuff 
in it. I just like that it's just stuff and it's it's just work and it's what happens at work and it's the people that you interact with. I'm done. Uh, well, folks, I think it's safe to say we recommend Superstore. Watch it. Watch it <laughs> twice. Uh, Watch it twice. I think it's better the second time. Yeah, it's like it's like a it's like the 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 meal the morning after meal the the meal that you reheat the day after and all yeah, those and flavors are settled exactly that's exactly right. Um, so folks, uh, at the end of this episode, there will be the usual outro. It's a lie. It's a flagrant lie. We are not on Twitter. We're not on Twitter. I deleted the Twitter. And um, we're barely on Instagram. Actually, I don't think Instagram is mentioned in the outro, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, you know we. we <laughs> We usually say, well, you can find us here. You can find us. You can't anymore. You can you find, find us anywhere. You can find us increasingly fewer places. Um, but uh, we are on hopscotchfriday.com, which is a uh, Tumblr site. It's a website. Uh, it's a website, hopscotchfriday.com. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram. Uh, but we need to get more engaged in that space once again. But yes, the Hopscotch Friday <laughs> podcast, no longer on uh, Twitter no longer there it's not there anymore don't look for us there no but you can find us wherever you download your podcast because you're listening to us so subscribe that is true um so yes uh we will be back soon we've got a couple of things on the docket we want to talk about uh so yeah the outro was a lie don't believe the outro it's all a lie thank you for listening <laughs> this has been hopscotch friday you can find us via hopscotchfriday.com at hopscotchfriday on the Twitter or you can email us at hopfriday at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>